Who wants to get a message today? I want a message. I want to hear something. And you know, as I went through this week, it's funny because we, we all talk about how we all go through trials and tribulations. We all have frustrations, and it seems like the devil's constantly trying to do something to us. But you know what? At the end of the day, God gives us strength. And so the message today is perfect strength. But what kind of strength is so perfect, and, and how, what does that look like? How do, how do we get to that place where God actually helps us out? So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, and it says, each time, who's talking? Paul. Paul says, each time, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. And you think about that. Just for a second, and you say, who wants to talk about their faults? Oh, this will be fun, guys. Let's go around the room today, and we're all going to sit and talk about our faults. Come on, won't this be great? Let me tell you what I'm not good at. And you know, you know, hear, hear people say that, you know, it's like, we were at the VBS thing, and, and I don't remember who I said. I said, it, Jim was playing the banjo, and then the harmonica, and he plays the guitar, and all this stuff, and I said, man, I can play the radio. <laughs> you know, other than that, I'm not so, not so good, you know, but I try. There, we all have different strengths that God gives us. We all have different things that God can use us through. But listen, you can't become good at anything. You can't be good at anything until you are recognizing that you're pathetic. I know that sounds terrible. Recognize that you're pathetic. You cannot be good until you recognize that you're pathetic. Because that's when God's strength actually perfects you. And, you know, we think about it in our own life, right? You ever get, get to that place where you, you turn to somebody and you say, how'd you do that? <laughs> right? It's a little humbling, but at some point you have to get to the place where you're like, how'd you, how'd you get that to work? How'd you put that on? There are all sorts of different things. You know, we just did that at VBS camp when, 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 when uh, Bob and Wes are walking over doing the horseshoe thing and the ring's coming off and I'm sitting there and my brain's going, ah, <laughs> something's not working. How'd you do that? We've got to have the ability to stop and look at our situation and go, how did somebody else do something? See, if you can't get to the place where you recognize you're weak and you ask for help in that area, you'll never be able to go forward. You'll never be able to be propelled. So God recognizes that, hey, listen, we, 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 we are weak. We, we do need help. You know, my grandpa all the time working on things. Oh, my gosh. He'd leave my brother and I just there, and we'd be, he'd do something, you know, now do that. And then he'd walk away, and we'd be sitting there trying and trying, and all he'd do is tell us, don't cross-thread it. You're going to mess it up. Don't cross-thread it. He was always worried about that. But understanding that we're, we're not on our game all the time. We're not perfect. And in fact, being happy about not being perfect is the way it's supposed to be. For some reason in society, we have taught our children that they're to have the perfect life. That's the worst thing you could ever do for them. We try to teach everybody you shouldn't have any heartbreak, any sadness, or anything that goes wrong. But when things go wrong, sometimes that's when we learn the best, right? I mean, who hasn't had an experience where something went wrong? And, and went, oh, I now know we won't do it that way again. Ever put the blender on and forgot to put the lid on? After you've cleaned that mess up once, you will tell every child in your house, put the lid on! Put the lid on! Because you know it's two hours of work afterwards, right? We all learn... From weakness, we learn from the bad things that happen, and that's perfectly normal, and that's perfectly okay, and that's not God punishing you. Because we're going to talk about Paul today, we're going to see all of the things that he lists. Now, we know that Paul is the author of a good majority of the New Testament. Paul helped establish the Christian church. He established the very doctrine we follow, yet that guy couldn't catch a break. But when you read scripture, we don't think of it that way. It's only after he goes through and gives a self-assessment, you go, man, that must have been tough. 
That must have been hard. And it's those things that then all of a sudden we go, well, I guess, you know, it's not so bad. So look at 2 Corinthians. We're going to start chapter 11, verse 16. And what's interesting about this passage is Paul is noticing people boasting. They're proud of themselves. They're talking about all the great things they have done. Don't you love that people that are so proud of themselves? You just want to go, oh, good for you. I'm so happy. Because we all have things that we're not so proud of, and you're like, you've got to be kidding me. Give me a break. This is tough. This is frustrating. And so Paul says, again, I say, don't think I am a fool to talk like this, but even if you do, listen to me as you would to a foolish person while I also boast a little. He's calling out the hypocrites. He's calling out the people that are boasting about how perfect of a godly life they have. In fact, the people that you hear that want to sit and say how perfect their life is, run. Run. Because the more that they want to give you that perfect everything is going just so is, is, is the worst, worst setup ever. Because you know what? They don't understand. They don't have compassion. They're hiding things. We all know that there are things that we're disappointed in. We all know that people disappoint us. But if we only grapple to that, we don't get anywhere. But when we try to convey the gospel to other people, and we want to look like we're so self-righteous and so perfect, the very thing that we're trying to do actually deteriorates the testimony around us. So verse 17 says, such boasting is not from the Lord, but I am acting like a fool. Paul's saying this about himself. And since others boast about their human achievements, I will too. After all, you think you're so wise, but you enjoy putting up with fools. You put up with it when someone enslaves you, takes everything you have, takes advantage of you, takes control of everything, and slaps you in the face. Isn't that interesting? Well, I could list a whole series of things that we're seeing happening in our world around us right now. That's nothing but that. People enslaving us, and we think nothing of it. And then he says, I'm ashamed to say that we've been too weak to do that. Verse 21 still, sorry. But whatever they dare to boast about, I'm talking like a fool again. I dare to boast about it too. Paul's saying, I can act just like them. I can act just like these people. You go, well, where are you going with this? Listen, this is when Paul starts to bring in a challenge. He says, in verse 22, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Right? This is, it's, it's not anything new. It's not anything special. And then he says, are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. And this is where Paul is bringing out his pain. He's watching these hypocrites talk about how perfect and great everything, the life, the world around them is. And yet, they haven't had to bite the bullet like he has. Right? And this is where I want us to hear because we all have these things going on in our lives. And he says right here, But I have served him far more. I've worked harder, been put in prison more often. Been whipped times without number, faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people. The Jews as well as the Gentiles, I've faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard and long and during many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty and often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep warm. Then, besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches." who is weak without my feeling that weakness, who is led astray, and I do not burn with anger. So verse 30 says, If I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. I want to pull two things from this. The first thing is, his life sucked. It wasn't easy. 
Think of all the things he was doing for Christ. You get these goody two Christians, goody two shoe Christians, that sit beside you and say, Well, this is not going well because you just are sinning, because you don't have the favor of God on you. Well, what about Paul? Did he have God's favor on him? Did he have an anointing to spread the gospel? Wasn't he miraculously taught by God the doctrine? Isn't that interesting that Paul goes through all of that? He's beaten. He's shipwrecked. He has all of these other issues. He has all of these other pressures. Guess what, guys? It's normal. It's just normal. So often we get to the place where we think, oh, no, these battles aren't supposed to be happening. You know, a lady in our church said to me a few weeks ago, she had a dream about us. It was very interesting. She said, I saw you guys stepping on snakes and then another snake and then another snake like it wasn't phasing you. I went home. I just took that to heart because, oh, man, the battles that we have, the trials that we go through on a daily basis, just trying to run a church, just trying to go forward. Everybody has them. And so somehow, somehow in, in Christian doctrine, there's begun this thing that if you have enough faith, God will take care of everything and you'll never have a problem. And if you have a problem, you're out of the will of God. Because Moses parted the Red Sea, right? God got him through there and they had victory. But what about their daily lives? What about the daily frustrations? You know, they had to endure the very plagues, not all of them, but many of the plagues that went over Egypt. The Israelites got to experience too. And maybe they didn't have all the frogs in their soup, but they got to smell them. Like, understand that it's not easy, and that's not bad. So bring it to a different level in your mindset to say, I've got to embrace this. I've got to be okay that it's tough. I've got to be okay that I'm going to be attacked. I've got to be okay that other issues continue to bombard me in my life. This is perfectly normal. This is perfectly okay. It's okay. It's okay that I'm going to have different things come up. Just like Paul's saying, I have all of this, but I'm going to boast in my weakness. So it's okay to say, I'm not good at this. It's okay to say, we've tried as parents to do X, Y, and Z, and we've struggled with that. It's okay to say, I've struggled with this in my job. I've struggled with that. Because in that weakness... Then you can finally learn something. Then you can finally get victory. When you finally get to the place where you can stop and look at somebody and say, how'd you do that? It's the greatest moment that you get victory in your life like never before. But if you won't take yourself to the place to say, how did you do that? How did you get there? What am I doing wrong? Don't get it. Now, I want to put a caveat on this because poor Job was doing that. And then he had a couple of knuckleheads over there telling him worse information. Okay? You've got to put that through a filter. You've got to put that through the Spirit of God. But the point that I'm trying to say is there are some things that we are not designed to do on our own. That's why we come to church. That's why we work together with our brothers and sisters. Because there are moments in your life that you just can't do it by yourself. And I know. Because I'm living proof. I know I can't do things on my own. I try I've tried so many, oh, I'll get that. I'll take care of it. Just let me do it. You ever have that phrase? I'll get this done. And then you battle and you battle and you battle. Somebody comes over and goes, well, you forgot to put that, that piece right there, and then that'll go together. You're like, how'd you do that? How'd you know that? Right? You see people do that. I forget, I was trying to work on my car, and it was, there was a piece busted. I couldn't figure it out. I was so frustrated, so frustrated. And finally, I call the dealership. Of course, their genius is there. They're like, yeah, new part, 800 bucks, you know, because they don't sell you the two little parts. They sell you the entire mechanism, you know. And so I'm like, I'm devastated. And I call somebody, can I borrow your trailer, right? I already know I'm weak. They're like, well, let me look at your car. Okay. So they come over. We're looking, and I'm like, see, this do flicky there doesn't do that, and it's supposed to get the time. You just, well, that piece right there is broken. See this thing? It's not supposed to move. Well, I didn't know. I had no idea. I told you guys, I'm not a mechanic. Made a new piece, and the car was running. Seven bucks. A lot cheaper. A lot cheaper. Because I got to a place where I could recognize my weakness. 
Why do we try to do it on our own? You watch the little kids. They fight and fight trying to teach them to tie their shoes. I can do it. No, you can't. You're doing it wrong. Sit there and smile. That'll never work. But what do we do? <laughs> Good. Keep trying, sweetie. Bless your heart. You'll get there. <laughs> Try again. Now, do you want me to show you? No. Okay. I won't show you yet. And that's exactly what we do with God. Don't kid yourself we do it with God. I don't need you to show me. I got this, God. I got this under control goes back to that forbidden fruit, right? We decided we know more than he does. And so we just do our thing. And that, I think, is our biggest devastation you could ever imagine. But can we get to the place where we can boast in the bad things and how God makes them good? That's the point that Paul's trying to bring out. So then he says, verse 31, God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, who is worthy of eternal praise, knows... I'm not lying. When I was in Damascus, the governor under King Aretas kept guards at the city gates to catch me. I had to be lowered in a basket through a window in the city wall to escape from him. Now, we're going to go to next chapter, chapter 12. Now we're going to be talking about Paul's vision. He's talking to the church. He's saying, listen, people. He's given a message, but he has to do it in writing. I'm worried about you. I'm worried about your walk with Christ. Because he said in verse 12, verse, chapter 12, verse 1, this boasting will do no good, but I must go on. I will reluctantly tell about visions and revelations from the Lord. Why is he being reluctant? Think about that for a second. You're a man of God. You were called by God. Why are you being reluctant? We need to hear from you, Paul. Why are you doing this? And he said, was caught up to the Lord to the third heaven 14 years ago, whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. It's only God knows whether I was in my body or outside. He's going, I had an incredible experience. And he heard these things. Let's go to verse 5. That experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I will only boast about my weakness. Wait a second. He had a supernatural experience. And instead, he goes back to saying, but I need to boast about my weaknesses. And then if I wanted to boast, verse 6, I would be no, no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I've received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from being proud. This happens to pastors. This happens to Christians. We are so busy trying to live that God-ordained perfect life that we can't tell people if something isn't perfect. We want them to know God. We're so afraid that if we're a little too real with them that they'll turn away and go, wait a second, why would be a Christian? You say that if I ask Jesus in my heart, everything gets better. Well, it does in the spiritual realm. But everything in the natural doesn't always get better. And we find ourselves driven to try to purport that it's so perfect because then you'll see how great God is. But that's not the gospel, not at all. God is great. God is perfect, but I'm not. And neither are you. We know this. This is no secret. The only way to be able to show people God's love is to recognize our imperfections. I was talking with somebody this week. She said, I hold Christians to a higher level, and I expect them to behave differently than other people. And so it's devastating when a Christian does something wrong. I thought about that because we are held to a standard of God. We are not of this world, but of another. It's true, but we are not perfect. And the faster that we can relate with others, the faster that we can tell people we're not perfect, we're just trying to get there, the more of a testimony we will have than ever before. Because it's hard. And it's normal. Man, if I haven't mentioned it's normal, it's normal. Because you know how many people contact me to say, am I going through a trial? Is this because God's mad at me? Is there a sin I have done? And I'm trying to say, no, 
No, many times there's a lesson in that struggle. Because I can tell you from having to pull my well a couple of times, there's a lesson. You know what that lesson is? Put duct tape over the pipe before you start putting stuff in. Because inevitably, even when you're not looking, those rocks are alive. They will jump over and into that pipe and mess up the jet. Hands down, they will do it. I can guarantee it and prove it. Because the second time I pulled that pump, I made sure that thing did not bump any rocks along the side of the well as it went down. Yet six months later, I'm pulling that pump to find more pebbles inside that thing. Now, we go, well, how can it possibly get through the screen? Maybe it's one of you guys' little horseshoe things. But the fact of the matter is the screen is not to let those size of rocks in. And I learned very quickly, guess what? You put duct tape over your pipe. You get everything in. Nothing gets bumped or dirty. Believe it or not, no rocks are in that pipe anymore. It's been going for a year. This is good. We've made some victories. So what have I learned? Was God mad at me? Did God hate me? Was God disciplining me for something wrong I had done? Or was he trying to teach me some common sense? Hey, pay attention. And sometimes in our lives, those lessons are harder to swallow, especially when they're painful, especially when somebody hurts you so deeply. And you're like, how do I walk forward and not look at that? How do I not get distracted? And Paul's saying, I want you to be able to boast to one another about your imperfections. That's what we're supposed to be given as a gospel. To say, look how God has helped us through this. Look what God has done. Not look how anointed I am. And I prayed for seven people, and you should hear the healing testimony. But how is it going? Did you hear what Paul said? He didn't say, I'm going to tell everybody about this supernatural experience. You guys want to get on the internet? You can buy books all over the place for those, those exact moments. Here's all your supernatural experiences. How many books out there? I'll tell you, I've read a bestseller right now. Life sucks and it's not going to get much better. How many want to buy that one? Huh? Oh, yeah, I could make a good Well, listen, but that's okay. That's okay because it isn't about what we go through. It's the process. It's not the, all of these experiences. It's that process. And, you know, when Bree and I, years back, we went through a foreclosure. Our house, one of the first foreclosed houses, Way back when they were doing the adjustable rate mortgages, our mortgage tripled in a couple of months. And before they got the laws in and everything else, we lost our house. And did you know, within weeks, people were coming to us because we didn't lie about it. We just said, we lied, our mortgage tripled. I don't know what to tell you. I couldn't come up with five grand a month. Don't know what to tell you. It was too much money. And you know how many people started coming to us saying, hey, our mortgage just hit us. We're, we're, we're struggling. We're going to lose our house. And we're like, these are the things that you need to do. This is what you need to know. God set us up. We weren't perfect. In our imperfection, God used that to help somebody else. Man, that sucked. I'm telling you, it was hard. I'm not, it wasn't like, oh, yeah, we lost our house. We're the best. It was miserable. Don't think we didn't cry a few tears. Don't think it wasn't hard on us. And people are like, they are just so irresponsible. You know? And I mean, people would judge us all the time. Can you imagine that? What if they would have paid their bills? We had friends that wouldn't be our friends anymore because we couldn't pay our bills, right? And, and, and you know what? It was perfectly okay because God used that to help so many other people. We walked away from that years later, and we still go, can't believe how many people we got to help because of our disaster in our life. And I think that every one of you have disasters that you're going to be able to touch somebody else and go, yeah, that was painful for me. Let me talk you through this one. And when you're not able to do the perfect, you're able to show the perfect. You hearing me? When you're not able to do the perfect, you're able to show the perfect. Because we're not perfect. But God's perfection in us gets to go out and help his people. And that's where the true testimony is. That's where he's really moving. So moving on, he says in verse 3, Yes, only God knows whether I was in my... Oh, I, I missaid that. Sorry. Blah, blah. I got to go to six. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool. Sorry, Aaron. Verse six. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. 
But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see or hear in my life or in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from coming proud, I was given this thorn. I know I read this already, but I want us to hear this one more time. Hear it after what I have said, because the point is, in order for Paul, who saw people have miraculous signs, in order for him to stay on track as a Christian, he needed to be walking in a place of humility and focus on his imperfections, what he's not good at, so God can continue to make him good. And you know, they talk about that. You ever be in these corporate America or all these business meetings? They're always talking about how we have to do self-reflections, these assessments, needs analysis, statistic-based, right? We hear all of this stuff, well, what are we doing? We're looking at what we did wrong and how we can do it better. Wait a second, that's a godly principle. It's a biblical principle. We should be looking at what we do wrong and how we can be better. That's not so bad after all, right? Because at the end of the day, in our weakness, we're made strong. So moving on, verse 8, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. He's asking God, I don't want to have these kind of troubles. Think about this now. This is the guy who did the New Testament. This is a guy who founded this entire Christian movement to a large extent, and he's the guy that's going, I've got struggles. I've got problems. And he said, my grace is all you need. Wow. My power works best in weakness. That's what we started out with today. God's power is best when we're weak. And he said in verse 10, that's why I take pleasure in my weakness. And in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, that's easy for Paul to say, right? Who wants to take pleasure in their weaknesses? How's that? Oh, this is great. I love it. Oh, that was great. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. This is fun, right? You ever go, listen, go whitewater rafting, guys. You ever been whitewater rafting with somebody that's never gone before? <laughs> I'm not laughing at them. I'm just laughing because you want to talk about in the moment of weakness, they start yelling at us to bail. You know, some of us are having to bail, but you, you, you got to keep track of your oar and your bounce, and you got to be throwing the water out. And I can guarantee you, whoever is in that raft that has not rafted before is not willing to bail. <laughs> They're holding on to your Jesus. <laughs> As this thing's bouncing around, we got to get the water out. We've got to keep moving. We've got to keep doing something. But people don't see that. They don't recognize that. And we do the same thing in our own life. We don't recognize that we can, we can take pleasure that we're weak. We can say, I can't do that. I, I, I want you to do that. I'll keep doing the rowing thing. Uh, you tell me which side and we'll do it. High side, low side, I'm there, baby. But that's interesting because in our everyday lives, we lose track of it. We do. Because tomorrow you're going to walk out of here, you're going to get a trial, and you're going to start going, God, why? Why? Why now this one? Don't I have enough on my plate? Like, do we, I mean, if we start listing, it's like, wait a second, maybe I have more than on my fingers and my toes. And Paul said, that's nothing. I go through all that, and I still have the burden of the church. I still have the burden of carrying on and making sure that the gospel continues to go forward while I'm battling all of my personal battles. And every one of us has that same thing going on in our lives. We all have our own personal battles we're trying to deal with, our own things that we're sad about, our own things that we're frustrated about. We have to keep walking forward. Boy, that's easy, huh? Everybody loves it. So how do we wrap that up to be able to say, okay, you Debbie downed us this whole time, Reverend Killjoy. We appreciate that. But this is what I want to get to. This is what I want us to understand is it's okay for the trials to hit us. It's how we handle those trials that are going to change our life. It's okay to realize that you're always going to be going through something. And if you're not, you're a liar. I don't believe anybody that comes to me, and I've had a few people want to sit down for counseling, that, you know, everything's good, and our lives were just so blessed. The Lord's really blessed us. I'm like, yeah, right. I'm not saying that God hasn't blessed them, but don't lie to me. I'm not that stupid. Because I know we all have our own battles that are constantly hitting us. It's not abnormal 
is perfectly normal. It's what we do with them and how we walk through them that God helps us to gain the strength we need, to gain the education we need, and to grow us in a place like we've never been grown before. And that's what I want you to take home. I want you to take home today that when something hits you tomorrow, you're like, well, this is, this is part of it. All right, let's go. That's good. Give me your best shot. It's like the little kids that come up and they want to start wrestling with you and they're like throwing punches. You kind of just hold your hand on their forehead. They can't quite get to you. Put your arm on their shoulders and they're, you know, trying to get you. you. As soon as you recognize that this is perfectly normal, this is part of the, you're putting your hand on that forehead and the demon's just like, ah, you're like, move on. You're not going to rip me down. Life goes on. I'm not going to be destroyed because something's trying to destroy me. I'm not going to let it pull me back. So, I want to say a prayer over everybody. Father God, I thank you for everybody here. I thank you, Jesus, that you continue to guide us, you direct us, your anointing rests on our heads. And Lord, we thank you for all of the battles that come our way so you can teach us and make us great. Ask you, Father God, to have your anointing continue to rest on our heads in all of our respective ministries and all of the things that we do on a daily basis. Lord, keep us strong. Heal our hearts and our weaknesses. Heal the scars that make us tender. Lord, most of all, help us to continue to have a thirst for you like never before. In Jesus' name, amen.